Hello, everyone. Welcome to HIV R4P Symposium Series. So this is uh, today's uh, series is the third and final of the three series that we had. Um, my name is Nyaradzo Mugodi. I'm from the University of Zimbabwe. I'm a clinical trial specialist uh, and I work on uh, several biomedical interventions uh, for HIV prevention. I'd like to welcome you all to this um, to this symposium. So um, as you might know, uh, the International AIDS Society's uh, Governing Council and HIV R4P24 uh, 2024 Organizing Committee members, uh, we are hosting uh, this three-part virtual symposia series uh, that aims to bring together the scientific community in addressing the biggest challenges in biomedical prevention. Like I said, this is the third and final uh, uh, symposium. And the last two symposium of this series, uh, they featured how to scale up Keb LA and the vaginal ring and addressed um, where we stand in the research for an HIV vaccine with uh, lessons learned from the Mosaico trial. Today, we are going to be focusing our discussion on what the future holds for BNABs and this series overall aims to share the latest in HIV prevention. So in this session, we will have a look together at HIV prevention and treatment. Uh, I have two great invited speakers. They will discuss um, scientific innovation and societal impact as we unravel the potential of BNABs to impact HIV prevention. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Professor Florian Klein. He is a professor of virology and the director of the Institute of Virology at the University of Cologne in Germany. Previously, he was assistant professor of clinical investigation at the Lab of Molecular Immunology at the Rockefeller University in the United States. He has a he has his medical degree from the University of Cologne and a Master of Science from the Rockefeller University. And uh, uh, Prof Klein will be um, talking to us about requirements for BNABs in HIV prevention. Our second speaker uh, today is uh, Jay Ayer. Uh, she has led the expansion of the Access to Medicine Foundation uh, since 2015 from a small initiative into a dynamic change-making organization that produces rigorous research and insights on how to expand access to essential healthcare products in low and middle-income countries. As a CEO, she sets the foundation strategies for assessing the efforts of essential healthcare companies to ensure their products reach more people globally. Jay is an infectious disease scientist by training, and she holds a master's and PhD from the Johns Hopkins uh, School of Hygiene and Public Health and Na Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Um, she will be talking to us about the affordability and economic implications for BNABs. So before we uh, go to the speakers, I would like to remind our uh, audience uh, that uh, let us have a very interactive session. You are free to post your comments in the chat and we'll get to them after the two presentations. So thank you for joining us once again, and I'll hand you over to um, Prof Klein for his presentation. Prof Klein. So thank you very much for the kind introduction and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Let me start by thanking the organizers for inviting me and I'm happy to talk about requirements for broadly neutralizing antibodies in HIV prevention. So despite the great success of antiretroviral therapy being highly effective and allowing people living with HIV AIDS to have a normal life expectancy and not passing on the virus to other individuals, there are numerous challenges that we still face, including the access to ART, the daily medication, the lifelong treatment, and the lack of an HIV vaccine, and a lack of a functional cure for HIV. 
So despite the tremendous genetic diversity of HIV, the question is what role can antibodies play to, to target and to tackle these challenges that we still have? And this question was basically readdressed and reintroduced uh, a little bit over 10 years ago when a new generation of broadly neutralizing antibodies was identified and isolated by several groups, uh, allowing us to have antibodies at hand that are over a thousand times more potent and have a higher breadth, meaning that those antibodies can target uh, a larger number of different HIV isolates. So these antibodies were then um, tested in clinical trials. And so uh, this is illustrated at the right-hand side and summarized by Marina Kasky. And you see here that antibodies were isolated that target CD4 binding site, the V3 loop, the V12 loop. And these numerous antibodies underwent clinical testing. And each single clinical trial is here indicated by a vertical line um, that is in gray. So the question is, does this information that we have from the clinical trials now indeed advance our approaches to effectively prevent and treat HIV? And what I would like to do over the next 15 minutes is to give you four um, criteria or aspects that are very important for broadly neutralizing antibodies and talk a little bit about HIV prevention and finally introduce it to a new antibody candidate that might help to further advance this field. So I will start very uh, trivial basically with safety. And um, until now we have seen over 20 broadly neutralizing antibodies going into clinical trials. We have data from over 60,000 infusions. Antibodies were given in combinations um, as single molecules or um, with uh, drugs um, in single infusions and multiple infusions in individuals being off or on ART. And also, and we see later that this is very important, also in children, adolescents, and newborns. So that we can uh, summarize that BNAP administration is safe and has been very well tolerated. Secondly, antibodies are characterized by a long half-life. And you see that here at the left-hand side with antibody 10-1074, an antibody isolated at the Rockefeller University. And you see here that with a single infusion at day zero, you see that the antibody has still a measurable concentration even half a year later. And most notably, is that the antibodies that we are currently using almost all have modifications to their FC part of the antibody, allowing half-lives between 40 and 80 days, meaning that with a single infusion, you can still measure and um, see antibody concentrations after one year. So also uh, antiviral activity, so you see here data also of antibody 10-1074. You see um, data in viremic individuals. The antibody is able to suppress viremia at least for a couple of weeks. And then what we see is here, especially in this case, that HIV escape mutations can rapidly arise. And you see here data from individuals reflected by these single pie charts and sequences that are resistant to 10-1074 became resistant are uh, indicated in uh, the different colors. So you um, might want to appreciate that most of the sequences isolated here were then after a while resistant to this antibody. This, however, depends on the antibody. Not any antibody is doing the same. And how to overcome this, you can certainly combine different broadly neutralizing antibodies and one combination um, where uh, many of the trials were being performed is shown here, 10-1074 together with 3BNC117. And two examples I just want to show you from studies performed or published in the last year, one from the Rockefeller University and one from the NIH. And what was being done here was that people were enrolled um, being on ART, and then an analytical treatment interruption was performed. 
therefore stopping ART and continued either with placebo or with eight infusions of this antibody combination. And you see here that people that received placebo rebounded very quickly while people uh, receiving both antibodies had a long period of suppression of viremia. So therefore antibody combinations can certainly help to overcome HIV escape. So antibodies do not act alone. They are working in a concert with other immune cells and other antibodies. And that has been investigated in several um, analyses and investigations, seeing that the T cell activity as well as the autologous antibody activity can change after antibody infusion. And that might explain to some degree why we tend to see in some individuals a prolonged suppression of viremia. And this is one example here. This is a patient from uh, the outpatient clinic in Cologne. This person also underwent an analytical treatment interruption, receiving uh, three times an antibody combination, and until today is fully suppressed, although the antibody is already for a couple of years uh, being washed out. And therefore, there is control of the virus because whenever we take blood from this individual and uh, grow out culture, we are able to see the virus. So this is one example where an individual is controlled after an antibody infusion. So you might say this is a single example and we have seen post-treatment controllers before. This is absolutely true. But we tend to see that in many different trials here, also examples of the TITAN trial that was um, uh, performed by Ole Zogert from Denmark. And so it seems that at least there is a repeated uh, observations of this maintained control after broadly neutralizing antibodies. So the requirements for antibodies are therefore that we know that they are safe, that they have uh, a uh, long half-life, so this works very well. In terms of potency and breadth and the ability to limit escape, uh, great advances have been demonstrated over the last 10 years, but there's still room for improvement. And of course, we need to understand better how to use effective functions to indicate and to um, engage better with the immune system. Also, this is only the antibody side. There are certain aspects in terms of the infrastructure that is needed for an effective therapy, also in terms of the community. Um, so uh, those are um, additional things that are uh, absolutely critical, and I'm happy to discuss this maybe after the talk. So what do we know about HIV and prevention? So for a very long time, we knew that um, broadly neutralizing antibodies are able to prevent infection in animal models. And then in 2016 to 2018, the AMP study was performed. So the antibody mediated prevention study. Um, so this was uh, quite an endeavor and you can only congratulate the, the investigators here because this study was performed with over 4,000 participants in over 20 countries. And what the investigators did is to test placebo control of the antibody BSCO1 in high and low dose. And the overall efficacy of this antibody to prevent infection was not demonstrated in this trial. However, when the investigators did a sub-analysis, they showed that actually VSCO1 can be efficacious uh, when you look at the sensitive strains to VSCO1. And sensitive here means having an IC80 of below one microgram per mil. And when you apply this, then the antibody can be 75% uh, in terms of pre uh, prevention efficacy. So that meant that indeed BNAB mediated prevention can work, uh, but better antibodies are needed. So, and one example where this is in particularly important is uh, patients where we are people where, um, uh, where adherence can be a problem for many reasons, and especially in a mother to, chi to child transmission. 
And just to remind you that we still have over 150,000 children below the age of five that acquire HIV per year. Most of those children um, are infected from mothers that have an undetected um, infection, um, around 50%. This is happening during pre or perinatal and around 50% it's estimated to occur during breastfeeding. And um, uh, we know that postnatal prophylaxis is working quite well, but we also know that drug development and dose finding, especially in this vulnerable population is very difficult. And therefore it's, it's very exciting. And I think it was um, um, uh, really remarkable that very early on several antibodies have been tested um, in newborns. And you see here data by the impact network that tested VSCO1LS that was applied right after birth with a subcutaneous injection. And another um, a second group received an additional antibody injection at week 12. And what you might want to appreciate that the concentration is above 10 microgram per mil after 36 weeks. And this is certainly within the therapeutic level. And this is not the only antibody. We have several studies now where antibodies have been tested also in combination. And what we have learned is that antibodies also here in this population are safe and well tolerated. Um, we know that they have um, a therapeutic window. This is quite, which is quite wide, which is important, especially in this group of individuals. It might help to have a better adherence. And it has also been demonstrated that it's highly acceptable to caregivers. And with this, let me uh, share the last few slides with you, because what we have also learned that the potency and the breadth of antibodies is very important to be efficacious in the end. And this is just one example how we approach this. This is data here by Philip Schommers and Michael Schlotz, who investigated a large number of people living with HIV from different countries. They investigated over 2,000 uh, samples and identified what we call elite neutralizers. So people that mount a very potent uh, antibody response. And 32 of those were investigated with um, advanced and adopted technologies. And so doing this one antibody that I just wanna to show you two or three slides is called 04AO6. And so this is the screening data of this antibody. You see here, this is tested against different uh, viral variants with um, very potent IC50 values. And we compare this to reference antibodies at the left-hand side, you see that the antibody is doing remarkably well. And also when we test this antibody against the best antibodies um, to date, you see that it has an exceptional antiviral activity. So we wanted now to understand how could this antibody perform in a setting like the M study. And to this end, we um, looked at viral strains that were isolated within this study. And that was uh, data is generated here by Mike Seaman, Penny Moore and Nono Mikasi. And when you test these different strains, against VSCO1, which was, was the original antibody uh, used in the M study, you see that only a small fraction of these strains are neutralized. And this is the data here on the right-hand side, where we only looked at neutralization where, an IC8, where you have an IC80 below one microgram per mil. And when you do that for AO6, you see that 87% are being neutralized. So we wanted to understand what that means. And um, this is um, the last slide here that was um, data that is from Peter Gilbert's group. And what you see here is that we looked for this antibody AO6 in two different scenarios. So different scenarios in the terms of uh, with different PK profiles. So what you see in gray here is the prevention efficacy of VSCO1. So this is 23.3%. 3 
And when you now look how the antibody AO6 is doing, you see in the with a lower half-life, it's having a prevention efficacy of 66% and already 90% uh, when you use it with a half-life of 10-1074. And when you consider this antibody would be an LS version, you reach a prevention efficacy of over 90% with a single infusion uh, for a half a year. And I think this is pretty much where we would need to be. Of course, antibodies need to be combined uh, to even be more potent and to prevent resistance. But this is basically, I think, also what new antibodies can do and um, we hope to move forward uh, with this. Let me very briefly summarize. I wanted to show you that being at mediated prevention and treatment is a real opportunity. It's not only a scientific exercise, but it's, we can really, I think, do this, especially in certain settings like mother to, ch to child transmission. Viral resistance is still the greatest challenge, but can be overcome with combination of antibodies and by using uh, more potent and broad antibodies. We need to better foster BNAP inducing HIV immunity because this is basically coming for free from each individual and uh, we need to learn how we can use that more effectively. And also we need to combine it with new technologies like mRNA technologies, vectors, et cetera, uh, to make this as efficacious as possible. With this, let me thank, of course, my group. I showed a little bit data only from uh, my group, from Philip Schomas and uh, Lutz Gieselmann. There are many, many collaborators uh, that are involved in the studies we do. I also showed many studies and data from uh, um, all the colleagues in the field. Thank you very much for this and thank you very much for your attention. So thank you, Florian. Uh, we will move on to uh, I, um, Jay Aya. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you uh, today. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our work, and then I'll speak on the societal and economic impact of uh, BNABs itself. Just to give you some context, let me see how I can advance the slides. Um, when I speak today, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the Access to Medicine Foundation, and uh, we're involved in, in, in a multi-step approach to uh, convince the pharmaceutical industry to do more for people living in low and middle income countries. And we do this using a model of building multi-stakeholder consensus, uh, tracking opportunities and, and progress, uh, sharing best practices that we vet uh, from the pharmaceutical industry. And we bring uh, strategic change making by benchmarking companies, stimulating competition towards a, a stronger societal uh, goal. Um, the foundation is an independent organization. We're based in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Um, and where uh, most of our work has been known for the last 20 years in uh, researching the biggest research-based pharmaceutical companies. So these are the GlaxoSmithKlines, uh, the Pfizer's, the Roche uh, uh, of, of the world. Um, we are independent and we, that's not, we don't receive any funding from the pharmaceutical industry themselves or any of the healthcare companies. And instead, we are supported by uh, the UK uh, and the Dutch government, the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, Helmsley Charitable Trust for our work on diabetes, uh, the Wellcome Trust, and um, an investment firm also provides a specific grant uh, for some of our, our research itself. Um, our research is independent and crucial for our foundation's change-making uh, progress. Um, it's built on sectors and cross-sectoral programs where the potential impact is relatively high. Um, it relates to general importance of the issue on a global scale, but also to the fact that in, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, you have a very strong market concentration uh, of a few players that dominate the world supply of pharmaceutical products itself. Um, and at the moment, our theory of change is that the impact can be biggest in markets that are dominated by a small number of big players. Any step that they take makes a big impact on pe people's life. 
Um, the focus of our research is on uh, research-based pharmaceutical companies, but we've recently done uh, some research on the generic industry, uh, medical gas companies, vaccine manufacturers, and in the future, we'll be doing more on diagnostic companies itself. Um, at the moment, uh, we also have two cross-sectoral programs in place, focusing on uh, diabetes care and uh, antimicrobial resistance, uh, which is part of some, a program called the AMR Benchmark. We have um, a special report, which is on sexual reproductive health and rights uh, products. And in this research, we show how the pharmaceutical industry can impact access to essential medicines uh, for women uh, and girls. Um, the findings indicate that among the SRHR products, uh, there's a lot of specificity that's focused on HIV products. Uh, these dominate the research and development pipelines and portfolio. Uh, they do get a lot of attention from many different stakeholders and are more likely to be uh, available in low and middle income countries. Uh, specifically, the last research that we published, uh, which is called the 2022 Access to Medicine Index, registered 24 products for medicines and two projects on preventative and therapeutic medicines that can address current gaps in HIV treatment. Now, at the same time, we're seeing that among the industry, many, many companies are starting to leave infectious disease research, which is a bit of a worrying trend because we're seeing fewer and fewer pharmaceutical companies who have the ability and the capacity to research, develop, and bring at scale products to the market. And many of them are actually leaving this area because there's not a lot of revenues um, that they uh, can make and profit margins that they can make. And they're leaving for more lucrative business, um, uh, therapeutic areas such as uh, cancer care and metabolic diseases. In our research, it is important that it's not only that the pharmaceutical industry needs to change, but the investors who invest in the pharmaceutical industry also play a role in driving this level of change. It's been increasingly common for investors to consider their investments purely from a perspective of financial returns. But the impact that, that the pharmaceutical industry have on the world at large is also uh, critically important. And more investors are starting to acknowledge this. Um, this concept in finance has become known as the double materiality. And generally what we've seen is we've actually built in a sort of an army of investors. At the moment, we have 138 investors that manage assets over uh, uh, 22 uh, trillion US dollars. And they use the work of the foundation in different ways, depending on what type of investor they are and what their views are on investment strategy itself. But broadly speaking, they use their work to inform the investment decisions through quantitative and qualitative analyses. And they also um, engage with the companies, vote differently on which companies they want to support um, and uh, based on some of the, the results that we have shown. So risky behavior and companies that do not support equitable access um, uh, is, is considered bad by investors itself. The signatories of our statement include different types of investors, including mainstream investors, responsible investors. There's been a trend now for environment, social and governance, ESG investors and impact investors. And they all play a significant role in driving the pharmaceutical industry's response to, to broadening access. Um, media is a really important platform for us. Um, insights from our research are regularly featured in a range of international media outlets. By engaging with the press, we ensure that our findings reach a wide audience globally and increase the, the change-making impact and also inform uh, people and their communities on the power that they have in, in uh, demanding broader access uh, from the pharmaceutical industry and the stakeholders. Now, the previous speaker has already spoken a bit about the, uh, the opportunity at hand, but I just wanted to acknowledge the fact that, you know, when we are thinking about HIV, we still see globally about 30, over 30 million people are living with HIV AIDS. And at the end of it, 80% of the people um, are living in low and middle income countries. So any interventions that are designed need to be made available for people living in low and middle income countries itself. And despite advancements in treatment and prevention, about 1.3 million people contracted HIV in 2022. And 60% of these new infections occur in Sub-Saharan Africa in vulnerable population groups, um, including men who have sex with men, people who inject drugs, sex workers, adolescent girls, and young women. So solutions need to be put in place in order for uh, people all around the world to enable access itself. 
In alignment with this, HIV AIDS is still the leading cause of death for women of reproductive age, specifically in Sub-Saharan Africa, and one of the leading causes in this population uh, group globally. Vulnerable population groups uh, face significant barriers in accessing appropriate healthcare services, as well as gaining access to existing treatment and preventative medicines itself. When you think of um, VNABs itself, uh, developing monoclonal antibodies in the field of HIV AIDS was considered to be a breakthrough for HIV research and specifically um, uh, HIV prevention. And today, about uh, I think the previous speaker has spoken about the opportunity and the discoveries uh, that, that is there in front of us. Um, Traditionally, um, what you know, what you see that the results um, that Florian has shown earlier is that while they are, um, it's an it's an amazing set of, of results that have been have been. Um, you show the tolerance rates, and uh, you also see that that uh, safety and adherence can significantly be be improved. Um, the discovery of BNAPs can also contribute to the development of uh, vaccines, active immun immunization, or other treatment op options, which can ultimately lead to curing HIV. Now, while these findings sound promising with all people, especially be, uh, ones living uh, and affected by HIV, you know, will they be able to benefit from the new breakthrough products? Um, examples from other fields of research, such as oncology, indicate that it's going to be just the opposite. Specifically in LMICs, unless we do something about broadening access today, we're not going to see the broad access that we need to, to have in place itself. Monoclonal antibodies are mostly developed and are thus available for non-communicable diseases. Very little is actually available for infectious diseases. And the gap of availability is also reflected in the following uh, quote. Um, I quote here from uh, Welcome and the Yavi report that some of you may have seen. 80% uh, of licensed monoclonal antibodies are sold in the United States, Europe, and Canada. And only 20% of monoclonal antibodies are sold in countries that make up 85% of the world's population. So this tells you that equity, um, global access and equity is not a given. Despite challenges that innovators have along the way, we must strive to make broader access to life-saving commodities to populations that need them the most. Now, when you think about research uh, in the past few years, um, people have shown uh, in the research that many antibiotic products often take longer to be available in LMICs. To give you a couple of examples, the, the strongest difference actually was seen with Herceptin, uh, which is uh, used for, for breast cancer, which only became available in countries like Zimbabwe 16 years after it was approved in the United States. Um, three other antibody products uh, uh, are also still not even registered in, in countries like Zimbabwe, even today itself. Countries like Egypt, which is a lower middle income country, uh, a product like Humira that, that is worth a lot in the pharmaceutical industry is only approved eight years after the United States. So at the end, if we really zoom out, when you think about the, the data behind it, there are hundreds of monoclonal antibodies registered in US and EU respectively, and there's very little actually uh, registered, even available in low and middle income countries. At the end, this adds up to the market share of about 70% of the, of the market being centered around US, Canada, and EU for antibodies itself. And as a comparison, Africa has a market share of uh, less than 1%, and the Asia-Pacific, including India, is about 16% of the market share for antibodies itself. Availability does not mean access. Affordability is a major barrier. Antibiotic products are very expensive, which means that private sales often lead to catastrophic expenditure for patients and uh, people living in LMICs itself. I mean, a clear trend is visible. It shows that antibody treatments are mostly not going to be reimbursed or not even on national lists in low and middle income countries, making the products unaffordable for most of the populations itself. Now, um, here you, you can see a little bit about the fact that the monoclonal antibodies remain unaffordable for most of the world population, especially in LMICs. On one hand, this is attributed to the complex development process, which goes hand in hand with expensive production and manufacturing. On the other hand, the focus of many uh, research and development um, based companies in high income countries and thus uh, you know, provides very little or no incentive to make products available in low and middle income countries itself. So we feel that it's really important for companies that are involved in biosimilar manufacturing to come in early to address the issue of affordability by starting to manufacture and preparing their plants to be able to manufacture lower priced products and make them available itself. 
Uh, India has the, one of the best availability of other monoclonal antibodies among low and middle income countries because of the size of its large biosimilar industry itself. Um, since monoclonal antibodies, uh, BNABs are rather new technologies, uh, products are largely going to be on patent. So we also need to make sure that there's more responsible um, management of intellectual property rights so that you're getting broader access in countries itself. When you think about accessibility, um, I, I think uh, Florian has definitely shown um, that um, there's a lot of benefits in, um, with, with how uh, the studies have actually been um, conducted in, in also building that capacity in countries itself. Uh, we have to look at other factors when we want to improve accessibility in, in addition to economic uh, aspects it, it is, um, that's, that's important here. Crucial to consider local capacity. Uh, in low resource settings, healthcare facilities and infrastructure are not at the same level compared to high income countries for which medicines are primarily developed itself. So aspects such as cold chain maintenance, distribution pathways, manufacturing processes need to be optimized today in order for us to see the broad availability um, of uh, monoclonal antibodies in, in uh, low and middle income countries. Um, additionally, the form of administration can also impact accessibility. Um, the current way of administrating uh, BNABs uh, via uh, subcutaneous or intravenous injection itself can be applicable to, to many countries itself, but are not applicable in a population scale. And so at the end of it, we need to keep innovating on the application route uh, um, that uh, people are going to receive uh, BNABs in, in the world itself. When you're thinking about how to ensure access, um, we've shown that it is possible for companies to engage in, in broader access if they uh, consider access early on in research and development. Um, it shows very well in uh, the development of BNABs that it is important to be early on considering the potential barriers to accessibility, specifically the needs of high burden population, local capabilities, the healthcare infrastructure needs to be considered. Having clinical studies already sets uh, in, in low and middle income countries already sets a standard for what to expect when a product is made available in the market. But there's still many things that needs to, to happen itself um, in order for, for that broader access to be made available itself. Um, another part that is important here is uh, the impact of uh, product registration itself. Um, if the products are not registered in countries, they will not be made available. Uh, in order to make products available, uh, existing pathways need to be made, um, uh, need to be utilized by the pharmaceutical industry to ensure rapid registration. And companies need to early on collaborate with local and international regulatory bodies and policymakers to enable that broader registration and, and access eventually. Um, the central collaboration is also in developing the right level of public-private partnerships, again, locally and globally. And here we find that it is important that a generic and a biosimilar industry can also contribute to expanding access uh, to, to key products itself. The example of India shows this. Um, it has a big enough uh, biopharmaceutical and biosimilar industry and that has made a difference between the availability of monoclonal antibodies in many fields of research, especially when you're thinking about comparisons to other low and middle income countries uh, around the world. Um, in this context, you do want to see that companies that are patent holders of uh, monoclonal antibodies are um, engaged early in voluntary licensing agreements um, so that you can get broad access in uh, low and middle income countries uh, in, 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 uh, in for, for these key products itself. Um, lastly, I did want to point out one, one other piece of information. Um, at the moment, manufacturing capacity is largely centered around uh, US, Europe, um, which is about more than 30% um, uh, each uh, when you're thinking about um, countries that actually are responsible for um, developing and producing um, uh, key products for, for patients all around the world. Uh, India and China and Japan collectively um, have about uh, 10, 10 and 10 to 30 percent of uh, the manufacturing capabilities for also new, uh, new products and existing essential products. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, it is less than 1 percent. There's a lot of discussion now on improving local manufacturing 
of uh, key essential products, including vaccines, and one day for uh, BNABs in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa itself so that we have broad availability uh, in the continent that needs uh, access the most itself. And for that, you need partnerships, technology transfer, and the utilization of, of uh, voluntary uh, licensing agreements in place between innovators and companies uh, in order to have that broader access in, in the world. With that, I thought I'll stop here. Um, you know, feel free to connect with me and the foundation via both social media and our different uh, LinkedIn pages. Uh, we've got a number of different best practices that are available from our research reports on how can the industry do better in broadening access. Um, at the end, it needs advocates and it needs activism from uh, the communities in order for us to broaden access to life-saving uh, uh, therapies, treatments, and preventative products. And I think the opportunity, as uh, Florian has pointed out here, is right in front of us with BNABs. Um, it is safe, it is well-tolerated, and you know people need broad access. Thank you very much. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much, um, Jay and Florian, for two wonderful talks. I'm sure the audience agrees that uh, these were were very good talks. Complimentary. We started with the science from Florian in terms of. Uh, um, how antibodies uh, uh, can prevent HIV in st uh, strains which are sensitive. He talked about the AMP studies. He talked about uh, analytical tr uh, treatment interruptions. He talked about uh, how to lengthen half-lives of broadly neutralizing antibodies. And um, he talked about LS mutations and prevention of mother-to-child transmission. What a packed uh, presentation. Thank you, Florian. And Jay, thank you. Um, you are to, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you are talking to the converted because I come from, you use Zimbabwe a lot in, in your, uh, as an example, in terms of how um, effective interventions, they take time to reach the people who need it most. So really we need uh, interventions which are affordable. Uh, what are the economic implications? How can we um, shorten the regulatory pathways so that uh, interventions broadly neutralizing antibodies will get to the people that need them the most in a timely uh, manner. So thank you very much. Uh, we've, uh, we're starting to get uh, questions uh, from our audience. I'll start with you, um, Florian. Uh, I think because of time, you really didn't tell us about the uh, the immune response, the basic immune response uh, to HIV. Um, I've got a question here from a colleague in Zambia. She was asking Ida, um, Ida, Ida Mlala from Zambia, after how long, I think she meant to say, uh, after how long does one start to produce broadly neutralizing antibodies? So that's uh, uh, one question. And I'll give you another question, Florian, so that uh, we save time. Uh, there's also a question from Nompelelo Mkwananzi. Uh, they would like to know the half-life of antibodies in general. What is the maximum time of viral rebound after treatment interruption? So Florian, could you start there, please? Yes, thank you very much. I'm happy to do so. Both are very uh, important questions. I start with the first one. So usually it takes a couple of years until individuals who live with HIV uh, develop antibodies that we would consider broadly neutralizing. And for the person itself, this is not a benefit uh, usually because the virus is always a step ahead. So although you might develop these broadly neutralizing antibodies, uh, for yourself, the virus is usually able to escape. So, but um, what we see and when we look for um, characteristics and for factors that are more likely that people develop these antibodies, uh, it usually is goes along with time. It is also associated with a longer time of being viremic, because that means that the virus interacts for a longer period of time with the immune system. And uh, so these are, and also some features of the virus that uh, 
one is infected with. But this is kind of what, um, what are factors for the development of BNAPs. But as I said, for a person who developed BNAPs by him or herself, uh, this is not an advantage. So therefore, you know, of course, everyone uh, who's infected should be treated, uh, although this might limit a little bit the uh, likelihood that BNAPs develop. And for the second question, uh, so in terms of the half-life of the antibodies, if I understood that correctly, um, um, on the one hand, the examples I showed that antibodies can half lives up to 100 days. We know that from some other antibodies, for example, target antibodies targeting RSV or for the uh, HIV B NAVs up to 80 days. And this, of course, allows um, uh, treatment for or antiviral activity for a long period of time although you are not, do you not, don't need a very frequent infusion. So I think if we find a way to provide infusions every half a year or maybe every three months and can continue with this and um, uh, being effective and full antiviral activity, so that would certainly change how we could uh, treat infection. Thank you so much, um, Florian. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, the half-life is really important. And uh, thank you for going through the, um, the immune response to HIV. And when, we, uh, when an HIV-infected person develops uh, uh, broadly neutralizing uh, antibodies. So uh, to give uh, Florian a bit of a breather, um, there's a question to Jay. What steps should Africa as a whole take to increase their market uh, sell for BNABs? And what should advocates focus on uh, as we sort of, as they or we, uh, the royal we, advance advocacy for uh, BNABs? So what should Africa do? Or maybe not just Africa, what about other uh, resource limited settings. I think I'll re, uh, rephrase the, uh, uh, the speaker, uh, the question here. So what should resource limited settings do uh, and what should advocates uh, um, uh, focus on? You talked about equity, you talked about uh, diversity and inclusion, uh, but uh, inclusion and uh, diversity is not that diverse. So what should uh, resource limited settings do? Thank you, Jay. Sure. Um, so I think there's a lot that can be learned in terms of the setup and the design uh, that went into uh, some of the clinical studies itself that explains uh, a lot about um, how to store, how to administer, what kind of monitoring needs to be put in place. Um, but there's a lot behind it. Supply chains need to be um, strengthened. Um, capacity um, uh, and, and knowledge about about BNABs, you know, what 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 are BNABs needs to be um, broadly uh, made available in order for for uh, health healthcare practitioners to also understand what are the treatment choices in front uh, uh, in front of them. So, I think there's a number of steps that resource limited st settings, um, you know, policymakers in resource limited settings, advocates um, and NGOs need to take in strengthening that entire supply chain that uh, that plays an important role um, in uh, ensuring that products are going to actually make it to uh, people who need them. And there's a lot of learnings um, even uh, from the clinical studies itself that can be brought forward. Uh, a second thing is um, to, uh, to stabilize the market. We need to ensure that there is an understanding of uh, how many patients actually are uh, eligible to take uh, to use BNABs uh, what is going to be the consumption uh, rate uh, look like in terms of yearly expectations? Uh, so in that way, help to create a, a, a demand forecast um, that will help eventually manufacturers to understand how much do I need to prepare to make in order for, um, uh, for, for a company to also say, look, this is actually uh, worth my investment. Because I'm pretty certain that the uh, the volume estimates that uh, the industry have in front of them are grossly uh, smaller than what you actually expect um, in terms of uh, the ability for these kind of products to actually make a, a big difference. 
Um, lastly, um, you know, I think there's a lot of um, conceptions around uh, it's a com it's a complex kind of a product to manufacture. Uh, there might be quality issues. Uh, in, we need to look at pharmacovigilance. Um, and Florian also pointed to the fact that uh, viral resistance uh, is an important factor to pay attention to. And there, I think resource limited settings and advocates need to pay attention to how do you actually limit uh, viral resistance uh, increases? How do you make sure that the right patients are, are getting access to, to these particular treatments? Um, and also ensure that uh, data availability um, in, in terms of the real use case of, of BNABs in uh, people um, is, is uh, made available so that we're learning from this. This is kind of like the first generation BNABs and eventually we'll see next generation products uh, entering the market itself. So there's a lot to do. Uh, but I'm a firm believer that it can be done because it has been done for other, other therapeutic areas in other parts of the world. Um, so we need to all advocate for, for broader access, but also do the work in, in bridging some of the problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. Um, I, I, I think our listeners are really concerned about uh, equity. And this question really is coming from uh, is coming from people in resource limited settings uh, because uh, people really believe that there's clearly uh, a profit motive. Uh, we learned from COVID-19 how vaccines were inequitably distributed in the scramble for countries. And that's a comment and question from Monica Kamkema. So I think you've partially started to address that. I think it's something that we need, especially the product developers, the scientists, the advocates, we all, the whole spectrum uh, of uh, interested parties in terms of monoclonal antibodies, we really must look of, uh, at equity and diversity. So thank you very much, Jay. I'll come back to you, Florian. Um, we've got a question from uh, Pedro. Uh, they say that considering the preliminary evidence that HIV-specific monoclonal antibodies with broadly neutralizing activity can prevent HIV, uh, as shown by AMP, um, uh, what could or what be what would be your expectation from an active immunization approach that could trigger such BNABs? So perhaps I'll rephrase this question and I hope I understand. So the, uh, the question is, instead of passively immunizing broadly neutralizing antibodies, how can we stimulate uh, active uh, sort of uh, active production of broadly neutralizing antibodies. And also maybe you can talk about vaccine development. What is the importance of the what we've learned so far in BNABs in terms of uh, uh, in terms of vaccine, uh, HIV vaccine development? So I hope it's clear, Florian. Thank you very much, Nira. So that's this is yeah, I think this is clear and this is a great question by Pedro. Um, so, you know, 10 years ago, a little bit over 10 years ago, when these uh, first of these new antibodies were identified, that also boosted the idea that since these antibodies exist and they have been developed in, in uh, individuals, so how can we induce them by an active vaccine? And of course, that would be the kind of a gold standard. And I think this is one of the most challenging questions when it comes to antibodies, broadly neutralizing antibodies and vaccine. And the difficulty is that these antibodies, as we talked a little bit about that, um, are mostly um, very unusual in the way that with a number of mutations they have with certain other characteristics. So they are really rare and the immune system is not making them easily. So it's very different, for example, to uh, comparison to COVID-19 antibodies. So here, these antibodies take a very long time until they develop. They, um, it's, it's, you know, it happens only in, in a few individuals. So it's a rare event. So, and now designing vaccines that do exactly this. So bringing the immune system to make this very unlikely event of this broadly neutralizing antibody, this is very challenging. And many studies, also clinical trials have started to investigate this to see, can we go from one step to another with different vaccines 
to bring an antibody to acquire all these characteristics to be in the end a broadly neutralizing antibody. And this is a very exciting field. However, it is um, also very challenging. And I, at least, um, I'm a little bit skeptical that we eventually achieve high concentration of highly potent antibodies by active vaccination. Uh, it would be fantastic if, if we are able to do that, but it's very, very difficult at least. And maybe we need to, um, to use other techniques and try to bring you know, antibodies um, by using vectors or by using other technologies that we can use that these very unlikely antibodies are then produced um, in individuals. So that might help uh, or might have a better, better chance. Sure, thank you. Thank you so much, Florian. And uh, you've already uh, preempted a question that has just come in, in terms of uh, studies on vaccine development using the lessons learned from BNABs. Thank you. I think that's coming from Zambia, James Mwanza. So just two more quick questions for you for now, Florian. Uh, uh, what are the advances in uh, reverse engineering a vaccine to elicit BNABs. I think you've partially addressed that. And then uh, a question from um, uh, Sue, uh, Omar. Uh, uh, no, for Omar, that's for Jay. I'll come to. The, I'll come back to that. There's a question. So there's a reverse engineering, and then it's great hearing about the BNABs. If they do not have a long half life and are transfused for therapeutic reasons. What is its efficacy when the dose starts to wane off? Is there regular transfer, uh, transfusions of BNABs? And do BNABs uh, boost uh, a person's uh, natural uh, immunity antibody uh, production? I hope that's clear. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, what we often see is that um, you can suppress um, uh, viremia, for example, by anti by broadly neutralizing antibodies. And if there's no escape mutations in the virus or pre-existing virus that is not sensitive to the antibodies, the virus suppression can lead as long as there's antibody around. And when the antibody level decline, then you see over certain um, below a certain uh, level, then you see rebound of the virus. So this is one scenario where you just have, the, you know, the uh, antiviral activity of the BNAB. When the BNAB is out, you see that the virus starts to replicate again. And in addition to this, what, you know, we see in only very few examples, but it seems to um, uh, I think it's, it's, it's very important and, and we need to learn more about that, is that these antibodies can also engage with the immune system of the person and might allow for better immune control coming from CD8 T cells, maybe also from other antibodies. And this is, of course, an effect that would be fantastic if, can, if this can be exploited to a higher degree and I think, um, you know, we need to learn more about that. But that, of course, would be ideal that we can also use the, um, the means and measures of the immune system of the host to better control HIV replication. Thank you so much, Florian. So thank you. I'll, I'll move on to Jay in the last couple of minutes. Uh, but just for your information, Florian, that uh, uh, you've got an offer uh, from Adam Cast Castilejo, the London patient. Uh, they ask, how can I contribute uh, to, Jay, to Jay's work and Florian? So congratulations to the two of you. And then there's someone who wanted to know what kind of patient profile is ideal for finding or discovering 
BNABs, whether it's excellent controllers or viremic patients. So we, we might not get to that because I uh, there was a question which came in a bit earlier from Sued Omar. This is a question for Jay. Given that neutralizing antibodies are identified in humans, can we say we should reject patents for them? How feasible is it to build capacity for its generic production in low and middle income countries? And what is the orientation on the projected cost per unit? In a minute, Jay. Oh, wow, in a minute. Um, so I, <laughs> I, I, do, I don't think that um, any of the pharmaceutical industry is going to uh, accept the rejection of patents. Um, and that's why uh, most of the international community is working towards making sure that there's some level of a voluntary licensing agreement uh, put in place uh, for BNABs uh, so that it has going to be broad generics. If a company refuses that, then that's when uh, the uh, company countries can actually evoke uh, compulsory licensing arrangements to force companies to uh, broaden access uh, and, and relinquish power on intellectual property. Um, I think it's a very hot topic because at the end of it, if we need to bridge equity uh, gaps in, in, in access, we either need the company and we cannot base it just on goodwill alone. We need to have something that is guaranteeing broader access for patients who need it the most. And so there's a lot of uh, work being done also now on Cabalet that will pay, pave the way for what it's going to look like for uh, BNABs in the future. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um... Time is not on our side. We could continue discussing these uh, uh, important BNABs. Uh, they are not just important for HIV prevention, but they are also important uh, for, uh, for treatment, also analytical treatment interruption. So thank you so very much to the two of you, Florian, Prof Klein, and Prof uh, Aya. Thank you so much for this uh, packed uh, discussion. And to our audience, sorry, we couldn't cover all the questions, uh, but thank you so very much and i wish you a great day a good evening wherever you are in the part uh, whatever part of the world you are we are in this together and i believe i'm a proponent for broadly neutralizing antibodies i believe they will be instrumental uh, in uh, helping us to end the scourge of HIV. So to our sponsors, to IAS, HIV R4P, uh, Florian and Jay, and everyone else behind the scenes, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful evening. Goodbye now. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.